Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spiral Dynamics Integral Live. Today, we have Dr. Mark Foreman with us. He's a licensed clinical psychologist, and he wrote an important book, a seminal book in the field of integral psychotherapy. The title of the book is A Guide to Integral Psychotherapy, Complexity, Integration, and Spiritual Spirituality in Practice. And he's also more recently the author of a book titled The Monster's Journey from Trauma to Connection. And Mark has spent the last 20 years teaching and studying men's issues, as well as working with men, women, and couples in therapy. So we are excited for him to be giving his talk, where he will give us more insight into men's issues and how we need to balance both men and women's issues to have hopefully a more integral society. So with that, I hand it over to Mark. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I think I should probably start with <clears throat> just a bit more context. Um, so I've been a very active member of the integral community, uh, not as directly the spiral dynamics community, although there's so much cross pollination that most of my integral peers have taken uh, taken um, education with Don Beck and others in the spiral world. So for me, they're quite um, uh, intertwined but they have also, I, I know their differences and so, some of which sometimes get into controversial areas, but uh, I'm coming from uh, the perspective of someone who's really watched gender discussions uh, and debates since the earliest formation of an integral community, which you could say was in the early aughts, early to mid aughts. So um, I'm not coming to this debate or discussion as an outsider um, with my comments sort of coming from an external critique only. Um, I'm also making comments today and talking about the subject uh, from my experience just on the inside and having watched uh, gender discussions and uh, participated quite a bit online myself. So I just wanna say that sort of I'm part of the home team in a way. Um, and my hope uh, with today's discussion is just to introduce um, some hopefully novel perspectives or clarify uh, some new perspectives that I think uh, need to be a part of our gender discussion if it is to rise to the level of a integral or teal or yellow uh, discussion and uh, worldview related to gender. Uh, so I'm happy to be here um, and uh, have this chance to talk to uh, some new folks I haven't met within the larger integral worldview. Although I did uh, recognize Bill Argus, who I have crossed paths with many times. Um, so Veronica, shall I just get going on the, the meat of the discussion? Yes, absolutely. We're looking forward to it. So just dive in. Okay, so in order to discuss men's issues, which is a, a large goal of mine for today, um, it's really important that we start with the discussion of feminism um, because feminism um, sets the agenda for the culture, for our gender discussions so heavily. Um, in other words, feminism has become so pervasive uh, that 
it's really not possible to talk about men's issues, clarify what the problems are, the challenges are, without discussing feminism. And a simple way to talk about that would be that there are probably five to 700 uh, gender studies or women's studies departments uh, in the North American university system. And it's doubtful that any of them teach uh, a men's perspective more than nominally. Uh, it's likely that maybe a few of them would teach uh, material by Warren Farrell, but essentially uh, at the university level and into the graduate uh, degree range, uh, the discussion of gender is really the discussion of feminism um, and its concerns. And so that level of kind of dominance at the level of ideas means that anything trying to enter the gender space must uh, confront that uh, current state of affairs, more or less. Um, so uh, for our purposes, we can locate uh, the beginnings of feminism in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries in the West, and I'm primarily talking here now in the West and with a somewhat more American-centric point of view. And um, perhaps the most important event in uh, the early formation of feminism was what was called the Declaration of Sentiments, which took place in Seneca Falls in New York in 1848. It was the first uh, conference of, uh, if you like, women's rights activists or feminists. Um, and it was both uh, a meeting with presentations like a conference we would recognize today, but it was also a meeting which produced a statement, the Declaration of Sentiments, which uh, out sort of outlaid the view of this new feminist movement and what its goals were. And I think it's important to say up front that a number of the goals um, that that meeting and the early feminists had are things that I'm completely comfortable with that seem morally uh, and uh, socially obvious at this point in retrospect. And what those elements of feminism uh, represent is the, the call to um, expand the female role. So a, a big emphasis in my work on uh, studying men's and, men's and women's issues is that prior to a certain time in history, which is really modernity, which is really orange, if you like, uh, we really didn't have freedoms and rights as much as we had roles. And that's what traditional amber blue culture gives us. It gives us definitive roles. These are grounded in tradition and they're passed down. They're largely not questioned. And uh, that is done so because it has been decided that these roles function best to help the society essentially. And that's why they're uh, delivered as givens, not suggestions. So men and women had roles prior to modernity and the Declaration of Sentiment uh, uh, argued that it was pastime 
for uh, women to have the opportunity to take on the roles that men were able to take on, um, including having employment, for example, in any field in which a woman felt that she uh, was interested um, or suited for, uh, and, and so forth and so on. Um, and this dovetailed with the shift in the economy itself. So it's not only the internal decision that was being uh, um, reflected in the sentiments, but it was also the external economic conditions which were changing. And in Wilbur's analysis, which I think is still a very good one, um, essentially industrial and informational forms of economy were coming online in this modern period. And largely what they did was uh, take the physicality out of a number of modes of employment and create a number of modes of employment that were based on information. And so the physical differences between men uh, needing to lift things, move things, uh, do more dangerous types of lifting and moving things uh, somewhat receded and the ability to create jobs which were cognitive in nature and communicative in nature uh, was extended. And so at that level, there's really no meaningful difference between men and women. Uh, we could get into the weeds with the psychological research and pick out some very small, subtle differences that appear to be captured by psychological testing between men and women. But in truth, the Venn diagram of the cognitive skills of men and women is almost a two perfect circles overlapping. Uh, so most of the professions or all the professions that men could do with their cognitive skills, women could do as well. And this helped increase productivity uh, and abundance. And uh, it's a large change that is responsible for uh, where we are today in terms of a modern and then into postmodern society. So there's a lot in that transformation that is uh, an obvious evolution and a men's rights perspective um, or a men's issues perspective doesn't quarrel at all with those types of changes, nor does it quarrel with uh, a women's rights view, which says uh, a woman can still decide to uh, be a mother, stay home, raise children in that slightly more traditional role, or she can do a career, or she can do an admixture of both. So uh, the men's response to feminism is actually one of appreciation to the extent that feminism opened up the female role and really transformed it now to the point where um, when we run into uh, what you might call systemic feminism, we're running in more to exceptions rather than rules. And typically, if those exceptions are noticed, there are legal routes to um, redress those issues uh, already in place. So Title IX legislation would be a good example of something that's meant to uh, protect uh, gender equity, you could say. Um, okay, 
So that sort of sets up the positive pole, if you like. Unfortunately, within the Declaration of Sentiments and um, thereafter, and this is a very key topic, um, feminism didn't simply say, uh, we want to rework the female role so that it can be um, similar to the male role or so that we can take on expanded roles uh, just like men uh, and some expanded freedoms like voting. Although this is a harder topic because voting was um, slowly rolled out by the, soci by the society uh, in certain waves, if you like, and wasn't simply just granted to men regardless of their station. Um, it was granted in waves depending on property ownership, at least here in America, and as well by race. Um, so, but feminism did more than call for those rights, even though there was some internal debate more than just calling for women's opportunities, it also posited a historical theory of society. And this is really the key. And um, there's quite a bit of this reflected in the declaration, but there's one key passage which I think captures uh, the essence of the feminist theory of history, which includes the history of gender roles. And anybody can pull up the Declaration of Sentiments. Uh, you can Google it and pull down the full document if, to read for yourself. Um, so the statement in the Declaration is as follows, quote, the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man towards women, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let these facts be submitted. So the theory of feminism, and we'll call this first wave feminism, which is a typical um, marker that's used within feminism to describe its changing nature. So this is first wave feminism and its view of gender relations is that it is men's pervasive, intentional, conscious oppression of women that characterizes history full stop um, and without qualification. And we have to think about what this means and what it implies. Now, the first thing to say, uh, to give a little bit of leeway to these earliest feminists, the Declaration of Sentiments was published in 1848. Uh, the event took place in 1848. Um, Darwin's The Origin of Species, the book, was not published until 1859, so 11 years later. So there was no competing theory of how um, human societies would organize that feminism could then borrow and uh, take within their overall philosophical view, viewpoint. And of course that perspective would be men and women have aligned in roles that evolution has determined are the most effective uh, for the survival of the species. And these roles, to kind of put a name on them, 
uh, would be to say that the, the male role is largely to provide and to protect, um, uh, provide for the family and protect the family. And the female role is to uh, bear and raise children and uh, give organization to the home. Now, it was never that simple and women were participating in the economies as if you wanna call them economies, as far back as we can tell um, through, in, through hunter-gatherer societies. So it was never a simple, uh, this, this simplistic version of the man works and earns money and the woman stays home and takes care of the home, that's it. That probably was never the dominant mode for very long. And to the extent that we saw that in the uh, 1950s America was a historical blip and not a representation of what was happening uh, over larger spans of time. Um, but so in any case, the earliest feminists did not have a Darwinian view and so they couldn't have stepped back and said, okay, we have gender roles because of these survival factors. And can we see the female role in history and the male role in history as outcomes of these survival pressures? And so in one way, if we're judging feminism, or at least as, as I see it, we can um, say that, uh, okay, they, nobody knew about Darwinian evolution. We were not used to thinking that way, even amongst the intelligentsia. And so there's no real way we could expect uh, the earliest feminist to adopt a view of Darwinianism. Uh, in order to explain their theory. Um, instead, what they looked at was really the abolitionist movement. And uh, Frederick Douglass, in fact, the very famous abolitionist African-American was the single only African-American participant at the whole of Seneca Falls. Um, and so that cross-pollination between the abolitionist movement, the feminist movement was there at the beginning. Uh, I would argue this, there's a huge category error between mixing race and gender, but that is what they did. And of course that is also the foundational uh, story of Western Christian society, Judeo-Christian society is we have been tyrannically oppressed and we uh, with the blessings of our God are going to seek liberation from this oppression. So the feminists went to the deepest story well, mythological well, if you like, to set up their agenda of oppressor versus the oppressed. Um, so that sets up the beginning and there's the suffrage movement and there's voting rights in particular, there's changes in the economic uh, kind of lives of women that are going on. And this kind of continues a pace and it's not an easy process and uh, feminism had a role to play. Um, but then we get around to the 1960s. And of course, society is changing very rapidly at this point, uh, pushed by all sorts of forces. Uh, but particularly, we would say, by the birth of postmodernism and all that surrounds that. Now, this is interesting because it presents the feminist movement with an opportunity to rework their theory of 
the history of gender. Because at this point, Darwinian thinking by the 1960s is well established in the intelligentsia and even in the popular world. So the very famous book, uh, The Naked Ape by Desmond Morris, which was essentially a uh, <coughs> popular book about Darwinian evolution and human beings and how we're part of the primate line that was published in 1967. So there was this second opportunity, if you like, to come back to gender relations and say, well, what is the state of gender relations right now? And what were the causes? However, there was absolutely no reconsideration of the theory of men's oppression of women. They didn't revisit it, or they only revisited it by doubling down and then extending that into ever more um, kind of uh, sort of ever more new and sometimes subtle, sometimes not areas of women's issues. So like sexual harassment is what they sometimes consider like a second wave uh, feminist issue. And, but is it sexual harassment by, of women by uh, misbehaving males in a workplace? Or is it the consequence of this oppressive mindset upon women in the workplace? And the answer is it's number two. It's always the offshoot of this first principle of feminist theory. And so what happened during second wave feminism, which is roughly the 60s to the 90s, depending on who you talk about, talk to, is that the idea of gender oppression just got built upon a layer, you could say, of Marxist thought was, or neo-Marxist thought was added to uh, the mix, and we just kept with that arrangement. And the result of that is by the 90s, there is then a kind of academic and intellectual edifice built on feminism whose primary goal is to reinforce a women's oppressed status relative to men. And this is where the men's issues really start to become important. And also they start to meet the limitations that are being forced upon them by the feminism, by feminism. And it's really, it's good to highlight, I'm talking about an ism here. This is not a discussion of women. Feminism isn't a uh, group of women. It's a political ideology, a political and social ideology that includes women and men um, and uh, includes a minority of the population if you do studies and it'll depend, uh, it'll, it'll usually be 20, 25% perhaps will identify as feminists. So I'm not talking about a male versus female war, I'm talking about the impacts of an ideological group. And so what happens is the commitment to this oppression narrative is so intense that now it's, whereas you might have looked around and seen things that made you believe that women were being oppressed by men. Now they are being sought out. We are looking for gender discrim... Um, uh, we're looking for differences in gender, and then we are automatically applying the oppression lens. 
And this is a kind of a catastrophe for men's issues because any time a men's issue gets raised by someone and in the 90s is when it really started to happen, uh, it's essentially shouted down because women are oppressed by men and men are the oppressors. If men are oppressed, it's because they're oppressing themselves. Um, and a lot of the arguments are simply shot down because they can't be true, uh, because feminism says they can't be true, because they uh, interfere with that first principle. So probably the easiest one to talk about is the uh, supposed gender gap in wages due to discrimination. So no one argues that, that men and women make the same amount of money because they don't. Women make approximately 80% of what men make if we just take an overall aggregate. But the argument has been that that 20% is simply a result of women being pay, paid less for the same work as men. Um, the problem is people have now been looking into this for 40 years and the more and more you research, the closer and closer you match jobs, experience, um, specialty, uh, hours per week, commute, uh, so on and so forth, the smaller and smaller that pay gap gets to, to the point where it disappears or cannot be extracted out of the data, meaning that no statistician can show discrimination. Um, and this has been looked at now dozens of times uh, in full books, in articles, uh, so on and so forth. And yet it is resisted by the feminist ideological edifice. Um, and so the Democratic Party uh, essentially functions to repeat what is a lie about all Western cultures, because this has been looked at in every Western culture, uh, a lie that there is a gender gap due to discrimination. Uh, largely the gender gap is that men work more and people will say, well, women work full-time and men do too, but full-time actually means 35, to 45 hours. And the closer you get to 45, the more you find men. And the more uh, hours you work, the more money you make. And so that would be the simplest reason why men make more money than women is simply they're working more outside of the home during a regular week. Um, uh, so, but they, that kind of thing gets discluded from the analysis because it doesn't conform to this now old historical narrative that we have. So here we get now to the situation of, of men. And usually uh, I'm gonna do something that a, a men's issues advocate will do, which is to list just some major areas in, in which men are struggling, sometimes struggling simply in comparison, but other times struggling uh, just in and of themselves. And these are large social issues that get almost zero social attention. And this becomes the wall that men's issues runs up against. So sometimes people will say, well, why can't you talk about men's issues without talking about feminism? And the reason is feminism is the gatekeeper 
for gender discussion. They get to decide at this point what is discussed. Uh, it's been attempted three or more times to set up set up a White House office on uh, men and boys uh, to track those issues, and it has been turned down by three administrations, including two Obama administrations, and yet there's a women's uh, White House office for girls and women, and has been for some time. So starting with some of the big ones, uh, men die five years earlier than women on average. Uh, one could only imagine what it would be if that were the reverse. It would probably be called gender genocide, uh, if that were so but it just happens to be that it's men. And so that gets no social attention. Uh, men and women die at largely the same rates from breast cancer and prostate cancer, respectively, but the funding for prostate cancer is quite a lot lower than breast cancer. And there's no rational reason uh, why that would be the case. Um, men are about 92 to 3% of those who die uh, performing dangerous jobs. Uh, men are often asked to do the more dangerous, more difficult, more stressful and uncomfortable work. And this is an easy one to confirm for yourself. If you ever have the chance to drive late at night and go by a construction crew on a highway, you will see that it is not 90, if not 100% men who, who do this kind of work. Uh, um, men are more likely to be the victims of violent crime than women overall. And of course, that's not to say violent crime against women is not an important issue but we never hear that actually men are more likely to be the victims of violent crime. Uh, men are more likely to be homeless. Uh, men are 80% of the suicides. Um, men are now getting approximately 40% of the undergraduate degrees uh, with women getting now in the 60s. Uh, and that's a trend that seems to be pretty pervasive throughout the West. Um, uh, those would be some of the bigger ones. Uh, there are discrepancies in family courts and law, which favor women, particularly when it comes to custody. Uh, these are being challenged. This is an issue that does sometimes get more traction uh because of its nature but this that's an ongoing uh battle uh men have no decision making power in reproductive decisions which i don't think they should <coughs> have that power i think a woman has a right to choose however men have no power over paternity uh, they are determined and forced to take on the paternal role, where it, whereas they are essentially at the mercy of the decision of the mother in this case. So we have in that uh, sort of situation, a case where uh, men simply don't have any rights um, uh, relative to women. Uh, there are tricky issues in domestic violence. Um, there's a huge body of research. It's really significant. It's a, it's a mountain that has shown that there's much more gender parity in intimate part partner violence. Um, although women are two thirds of the more dangerously injured parties, with men being one third. However, there are 
literally no resources for men at all. And some people will say, well, men's rights activists want to take away resources from women. And that's not the argument in any case. It, the argument is we'd like to have some resources for men because uh, women can be physically abusive as well. Uh, there's also the problem that doesn't get a lot of attention, which is that women are more likely to be abusive to children, uh, but less likely to suffer the consequences of that. Um, when men and women uh, perform the same crime, men get approximately 60% more of the punishment or the time in prison, jail, than women will get for exactly the same crime. Um, and then there's probably the, maybe the mother of all statistical arguments, which is the one that women get um, sexually assaulted uh, about one in four or one in five. And this is a very contested uh, set of research in which you can look into how one arrives at that number. And um, uh, suffice to say, you can only get there by including sexual interactions that have any involvement with alcohol or drugs, regardless of whether a, a person or a woman in this case uh, believes she was raped. Um, and so that statistic is uh, often used, but almost certainly false. And then there's an additional problem that there probably is no tracking of uh, men who are coerced uh, into sex by women. Uh, we don't know how large of a problem that is, but the last Center for Disease Control uh, study, which you have to take with a grain of salt, showed a pretty significant number of men believe they've been coerced into sex or otherwise forced by women. But that would be a, an area of new study. But of where would the funding come from? Who's going to study that? What's the political gain in doing so? So there really isn't. Uh, and that's because of the nature of our gender discourse. So let's then step back. And this will be sort of my final arc of the talk. And imagine we're a group of people who want to set up a healthy spiral approach to gender so that at each level we can see some equality, some balance, some values that are uh, repeated. So let's say we wanted to set up a red uh, worldview. Um, we would want, if red is about assertion and power and healthy mm. egocentricity, uh, healthy sort of self, uh, self esteem or self possession, however you would want to say, we would want to look and say, can both men and women have opportunities to express this energy in their life? If they can't, we've got a problem as far as the spiral is concerned. And we need to redress that because that's not fair. Uh, but so if we go up the spiral um, and it were pretty equal each side, then we could get to a level where we could say, okay, we can come at this now from yellow and we have these differing worldviews and men and women inhabit different roles and freedoms and responsibilities, but we can integrate these and have a healthy approach to the spiral. But what I would argue is that in our gender line of development, 
what essentially happened is feminism went first in terms of undoing or um, opening up the female role and they chose a blue philosophical notion, an amber philosophical notion to fuel that development. And even as feminism has gone up the spiral and we see maybe a green postmodern feminism, they have not let go of that blue feminism. So we, and on the men's side, we really haven't actually stepped back and looked at the pressures and roles of the male role to nearly the degree that we have the women's role. We still expect essentially men to provide and protect and shut up about it. Um, and if you enter almost any gender discourse and start talking about men's issues, uh, you will get shamed. Uh, you will be told the issue is not unimportant. You will be told that men don't have the issue or they've got all these advantages so they, they can't have these issues. It's simply a race. Uh, from the discussion. So we can't get a healthy, orange, rational, empirical, uh, modern view of the male as a person, as a human being. We lack this orange transition, whereas we made the orange transition and we see more of the humanity of the female. So when people then come and say, well, I'm gonna offer you an integral approach to gender, what I see is a discussion between, you know, a blue, orange, green feminism versus essentially a blue uh, approach to masculinity. And then we call that the polarity. Um, we, we say that's the men's view, this is the women's view, and now we're gonna integrate this. Instead of having to go back, fix at the level of orange, the male role, and that would mean opening up the male role where it's not so expected for men to simply be the providers. And this is changing in the economy but the reality is changing without changing the expectations, or we don't expect men to necessarily do the most dangerous things. Men have to sign up for the selective service. They could be drafted when they're young men and sent off to die in war. Uh, women are not, don't have to uh, undergo that particular threat to their lives, those kinds of things. We don't have these kinds of balances. So there is no possibility of an integral approach to gender without this, this reworking of the male role. And there's no possibility of the reworking of the male role unless feminism were to loosen its grip on the dialogue such that we could actually have two competing opinions, just even two would be great. Uh, I mean, our society is very polarized now, but at the very least you do get a conservative argument versus a liberal argument. And there's something to draw from that polarity. Uh, we do not get the men's perspective uh, we get feminism's perspective. And so we don't have a generative polarity and you can't construct a multi-perspectival viewpoint out of uh, a total lack of parity. So we need to step back, correct this, particularly correct the oppression view. And this was something that Wilbur did in his 1995 book, 
uh, uh, Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, which is probably his most famous book. He spent quite a lot of time talking about how the theory of oppression uh, was a pretty terrible historical theory, uh, which didn't have a lot of good evidence for it at all, and uh, had a lot of evidence from the other side, from the side of the evolutionary role. But it's as if uh, that message from that book got ghosted by the rest of the integral world. Everybody missed that thing. And now we're still there. And that was 1995. So now we're talking about 25 years of uh, a non-change in our perspective, even when arguably one of our best intellectuals and not just him, there have been others and there have been feminists who have tried to fight this and they are summarily uh, kicked out 100% of the time. They lose their membership card. There is literally no card carrying feminist uh, who is accepted as a feminist who challenges this view of oppression and all that must follow from it. Uh, the examples you would think of, they are all pariahs to one degree or another. Uh, Camille Paglia would probably be the most famous example of a feminist, she sees herself that way, uh, who challenges these kinds of things through a historical lens and she's not considered a feminist by most feminists. Um, uh, so I think that was a, an overview and the sort of the bulk of what I wanted to say and that my frustration is that we are unable to have that balanced perspective uh, that would lead to the types of fruitful tensions in which we would end up with both men and women having their issues addressed by society in a fair way that humanizes both sides and not only one side. Uh, and uh, I've been talking about this for a long time, so <laughs> I don't expect anything to change overnight, but uh, do believe that we can make incremental changes, particularly in our perspective, and that those then cash out, uh, hopefully in future dialogues. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, this is the part where the other attendees can feel welcome to ask questions or make comments if they feel so inspired. Several folks also chatted. Uh, would it be good for me to look at the chat and see if it contains uh, a question as well? That would be a good idea. Okay. Let's see. So there's a comment by Steve. He says, I heard a talk by a labor economist that studies wage differentials. The key point is that hours worked over a threshold, say over 35 hours, are rewarded exponentially higher. Combine that with the fact that women are still typically the caregivers results in a huge pay differential, especially in higher paid jobs. Yes. So this is a very interesting topic, and I'm glad it was brought up again. <clears throat> so uh men are much more likely to fall into the category of what is called overwork, and that is 50 hours or more. And the benefits financially of overwork are uh, not linear. It's not simply you make that extra, you're paid $20 an hour, and so you make that extra $20 for every hour you add. 
it leads to all kinds of uh, promotions and movements forward. Now, that sounds great, except for the fact that, you know, my job as a psychologist and psychotherapist, uh, the number one complaint I get is people are overworked. And so it's, a, it's quite a position to be put in. It's not necessarily enviable. Women, when they run their own businesses, are more likely to choose a part-time role as the CEO of the business. They're more likely to make lifestyle choices which balance things out. Now, that's an interesting issue, which is, are those actually wiser choices? And, and many in the men's rights movement would say that in fact, they might be, uh, that women might actually be uh, having a better agenda here with balance. But more men are gonna work that full time. Uh, they're gonna do the overwork. However, and this is really, really important, when you look on average and you combine in-home work, so that includes everything like raising the kids, cleaning the house, cooking, and so forth, and then stuff we often leave out, which is like a man fixing something or building something for the house, et cetera. So we take those in-home forms of work and then we add the outside hours working at a job. The differences between men and women in terms of how much they work per week almost perfectly cancel out. And this is across Western cultures. Um, meaning like men work 15 minutes more per week if you add those things up. So there, and this is Department of Labor statistics uh, going back in time. And these can be looked up pretty easily on Google by anybody. So there's a myth that women take on uh, what they call the second shift, which is more home care and that that gives them an undue burden in overall hours. And the reality is it, it doesn't. The hours balance out for most couples. And, and then you have these sort of smaller group where one person is overworking, but that overworker is more likely to be the male and this is the leading theory of why men die five years earlier, because they're accruing stress, which is a silent killer, um, at quite a, a much higher rate than women are. And lots comes along with uh, that. Um, but as a society, we need to look more clearly at this so that we can discuss given the economy being what it is and and until there's some post-capitalist revolution, uh, the people who work more are going to make more money and suffer more lifestyle sort of uh, challenges. And the people who are going to work less are going to make less money, but have probably more life balance. And if we could talk about that honestly, without telling uh, our daughters and women that they're just going to get paid less, then we could give people the empowerment to do what they want to do uh, and say, look, if, if you're a woman and you want to accrue a lot of monetary power, uh, this is the pattern of work that needs to happen. It needs to be closer to this overwork pattern. And if that's what you'd like to do, then you should have absolutely the freedom to do that. But um, if you enter a profession 
and then decide to move out to do childcare, or that's the decision of the family, that's going to interrupt your wage earning. Now, this is an interesting issue because we don't, we have a biological situation which is constraining us where women are the child bearers um, and uh, there's nothing we can do about that for the time being. However, the data shows that women who choose to move into the caretaker role are highly satisfied with that choice and prefer it as opposed to the worker outside the home worker role. So there's this kind of discourse that it's, it's a role that's foisted upon women unfairly and is holding them back from this very career centric path. But if you do the survey data in the 90 percent tiles, uh, women are happy, uh, are happier to be doing these caretaking roles and they don't regret um, uh, having given up more of a career track. Now, one thing that the men's rights and men's advocates uh, folks would say is that there's a smaller group of men who themselves would be happier uh, staying home and doing the caretaking. Um, and we don't afford men the same uh, level of acceptance if they decide to drop out of the provider role and move to the caretaker role. And that this is one that should enter our social discussion so that both men and women now have more flexibility in who will care for the children. Um, and I think that would be a significant step forward. It would further uh, women's freedoms in their choices. It would further men's freedoms in their choices but uh, we're still in a situation where we more typically look down on men who would make that choice. Maybe not amongst a very progressive uh, edge of the culture, but the culture at large. And so this is a discussion that uh, is waiting to happen. Yeah, I agree. So Steve, whose comment I just read also has something else he wants to say, and then Josh can and then bet. So now we have some a few people lined up. Great. So thanks, Mark. Thanks for, for an interesting and informative uh, talk there. Um, I, th I think I, sh I share your uh, thesis about the male role still being the one that needs a lot of attention and that kind of toxic masculinity. And, you know, it's, I mean, I, I, I see my take on feminism is, is actually a, a societal change that both sexes should benefit from, right, in terms of that we're all humanized and equality is achieved in, in, in the kind of equalizing our humanity. Um, but I think there's some interesting sort of nuances to some of the stuff you're saying. So like on that wage differential side, you know, just if you look at it from the outside, it looks like a stitch up because where the big prizes are is in the places you can only go if you're, if you're not in a caregiving role, basically, <laughs> unless, you, unless you're prepared to abandon your children. So, so that looks like a stitch up uh, and effectively is a stitch up, you know, just, just the way it manifests. Um, and then in a capitalist society, wealth is power. So then it becomes also a power stitch up. And then if you look at the top of most boards of most major companies, it's still largely men. So, so in our kind of capitalist society, and, and most politicians are still men. So, you know, there, there's, the men are still controlling the whole game at the, at the top end. And this is when brings me to the next one, which is there's a class differential, which is quite important here, because I think at the big power end, that's still very much a male controlled game. But because of the changing nature of work, at the lower end of the class spectrum, I, economically, women tend to have more power because they, they have, you know, for whatever their orientation or their more or their outlook or skill set or whatever, 
the way they're engaging with it, they, they tend to do better in the workplace at that lower end. And so, and so I think some of this is coming from a sort of a, there's actually two things happening in two different directions here, where, you know, the, the top of the game largely still looks like it did, you know, 50 years ago or whatever. So it doesn't feel like huge progress has been made there. But if you're, if you're in a lower class position as a man, you feel kind of like your world's falling apart. And that, and that, you know, the, the, the girl you sat next to in school has now got a great executive job somewhere. So it's, um, you know, I think that that's an interesting thing here, which kind of confuses the discourse. <laughs> um, yeah, so let, let me know. There's my yeah. two points. Thank you. Thanks. So I think, you know, that uh, what I would say is what you just offered is a good uh, starting point that a men's issues perspective would try to problematize. Uh, so this would be sort of a discussion to challenge some of the assumptions that might be in that role. So the first would be that uh, a man who works a hundred hours a week uh, necessarily has accrued uh, this sort of free flowing power. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, a man who works a hundred hours a week and makes um, some kind of reasonable living has accrued uh, some financial power, but where does that power go? Uh, we know that women uh, are the controllers within the family of most of the distribution of the money. So men earn the money, but typically the money is then given to women as the consumers to use to uh, for the sake of the home, for themselves, for the family, and so on. And so there isn't this zero sum game where you have this man working 100 hours a week and then a woman who is in effect his wage slave <coughs> who then must do exactly whatever he wants because he's making the money. I mean, I've met with, I, I don't know how many couples uh, in my therapeutic career where the man is the primary breadwinner, but that is not how the relationship actually functions. It's much more complex. The power in the relationship is set by multiple kind of axes of power and money is only one and very few men are sort of sociopathically driven to say, I control the purse strings, therefore you're going to do exactly what I tell you to do. That's not what 97% of human relationships look like. The other thing that we, we could problematize is that all these power roles are enviable and that women are fighting for them uh, in an envious way. So the data actually shows just for one thing, women tend to win political office, at least in, in the last decades, at exactly almost the same proportion at which they run. So if you run 10 women and you run 10 men, you're going to have an equal distribution of who's going to win. So it looks like the population is not particularly sexist when it comes to voting. And so that's one thing. But the other thing is that being a politician is in some ways a miserable job in which you have no private life. You're devoted to at least an 80 hour work week, uh, most of which now is at least in America spent asking for people for money um, and, uh, you know, compromising your principles to try to get things done. I mean, we can look at the American president, uh, Joe Biden, 
And uh, as a sympathetic uh, left leaner, I feel terrible for Joe. He can't get anything done. Uh, he's the president and he has limited power because he has to deal with warring constituencies and another party and so forth. And so it's not entirely clear that these are roles that most women want to take on. There's almost certainly about a quarter of women who are very drawn to these roles, something like 20, 25 percent who really want to take these roles. And I think this is where, you know, feminism does a terrific job. Let absolutely open the door uh, for female candidates and uh, help them win office. Uh, but <clears throat> the lifestyle, uh, you know, um, uh, suffering that you do is something that can't be extracted from the job. And so therefore it may be that women are choosing against it. I mean, here in America, I could guarantee you that if Michelle Obama wanted to be president, uh, if she ran, she would almost certainly win. Uh, she's very well respected. Uh, she's very accomplished in her own right. And if you ever see her talk about it, she the look on her face is like, I would rather walk through the gates of hell than than be be in this place now obviously uh, it's, it's long been a hope of mine that she would run but there we go <laughs> yeah and she just and I, i'm projecting into michelle's head but i think she totally dislikes all of those aspects of the job that <laughs> where you can't get things done so it's just to say the men who do those jobs are human beings, most of them, not sociopaths, uh, even if there are more sociopaths, and that they are doing something which not everybody wants to do, and that it does not afford them the sort of ideal level of power that we imagine that a king might have. And... I think we can look back and say, you know, the monarch may really have that kind of uh, true power, but that that's such a limited number of people. It's, you know, it's in any population, a few people in a generation. And this is an interesting thing uh, because uh, traditionally, that role is a male role, but many times in history, it's been filled by women. Um, and it's interesting to look at, interesting to think about when we're talking about leadership. Uh, but it doesn't intersect much with what most of us face in this society or in modern Western society now that kind of power is hard to come by um, uh, for all those reasons. And even if you were to disagree and say, well, I still believe that, you know, that that man who has all that money has that power, I would say, okay, great. Well, at least we talked about it. Uh, and at least we brought out some contrasting perspectives and, we can agree to disagree, but we had a dialogue as opposed to what I see as the more common thing, which is, yes, of course, absolutely. Those men have all the power, full stop, and, and then we go from there. Okay, Josh. Yeah, thanks. I have a, a few comments and then a couple questions if that's all right so well just on the power thing since we were just talking about that I, I think it is true that those who tend to want to sacrifice much 
of their personal life and, and leisure time do tend to be, I wouldn't say exclusively, but close to exclusively men, right? And I think there's a biological drive there. It's also a societal thing. There's a lot of rewards for that, expectations, all of that. But I guess the question that I come back to is, okay, let's let's pick one of these male CEOs who may or may not be a sociopath, um, who decides to do these things that personally, no thanks. Um, but does that the fact that they're a man, does that in any way accrue benefits to me as a man? Like, do I, do I get anything out of the fact that they're also men? I almost think of like, all right, so there's this, I play music. There's a musician named Josh Groban, I guess. He's a millionaire. He's a Josh. Like, oh, see all the Joshes. And it's like, I don't get anything out of him being a Josh and me being a Josh. So I think sometimes that's very, very distorted. But yeah, clearly it is the men who take those positions primarily. I think that is changing. Uh, so it's, it's fair to address that. But uh, so regarding your presentation, Mark, so I've been tracking those issues for years, let's say as a journalist and writing on those. And your arguments, I would say pretty much up and down the line, I've, I've seen those and I, they seem to be, for the most part, legitimate and rational. And so what I've done is then I've taken those arguments, like, okay, well, here's, here are the best arguments for this perspective and taking it out to the rest of the mainstream world and saying, how can, how can one refute this, right? So looking at it as a journalist and I get crickets. So I'm not saying that all of your arguments are correct. What I'm saying is that I have not seen very good, if any, refutations of your arguments. So for those who want to say, well, well, some of the stuff that Mark is saying is inaccurate and it may be, I haven't seen great arguments taking those points down. So I just wanted to put that out there as a journalist, but to change my hat a little bit. So I, I work also as a coach and it tends to be mostly for men. I didn't set it out that way, but it just turned out to be that way. Um, I do think that, um, well, many in the integral community, we are addressing these issues, but we're doing it very carefully and very cautiously because we're realizing that a lot of the world is coming from that green blue. And for us to go in and throw a bunch of landmines into that is not only dangerous for us, but the fire hose of information tends to just trigger everyone. So I've started with very minor pieces like, so there are some orange scientific brain differences to a certain degree between men and women. And it's like, oh, well, that's hardly addressing it. I think that's where we need to start. I don't even think our society has gotten to the point where we, so I try to take the very small baby steps, the whole meet, meet the world where it is right now but I understand there are different approaches. Um, and that leads me into my question here. So um, I think that yes, the expansion of the male role, the role of men, however you wanna frame that, the way that women have done for the last, what, 200 years or so has, has yet to happen. We're still kind of in the dark ages of that, so to speak, maybe where women were in like 1800s, although people don't like that argument, but, but whatever. Um, so I do think that a lot in the quote, men's rights movement, which I don't even like that phrasing. And I think that phrasing itself is upsetting to people. But anyway, um, I do think some of those folks have been unfairly portrayed. However, a lot of them have, have been <laughs> accurately portrayed and they've not necessarily advanced the conversation because it's not taking track, it's not understanding where the current society is, or maybe it is understanding and it's just kind of like a, a knee jerk, well, I'm gonna go in there and just like beat things up instead of, well, what's the integral approach? Because a lot, a lot of those folks I suspect have not necessarily moved through those stages. So I guess my question is a uh, two part question here. So where would you see the modern men's movement on the spiral, that would be the first question. And second, do you think that it's the quote, dark ages of men's roles clearly is partly societally enforced and, and maybe even biologically enforced, um, but could, 
part of it also be that a lot of us men are not really open to that transformation, a transformation that might actually have to happen by testing out the manly man role and seeing where that fits and then seeing where parts of it don't. So that's my very convoluted long questions there. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, a lot of very good stuff in there. Let me see how I do um, with uh, addressing some of that. So I think the best representation of the either men's rights movement, I prefer men's issues. I just think it's a, it's a broader, uh, somewhat softer approach. Uh, there was a very, very good documentary called The Red Pill uh, Movie, <clears throat> which involved a feminist self-avowed filmmaker going and speaking really with the leading voices of the men's rights movement. And you get everybody sort of in their best, like kind of most rational space because partially because I think she's doing a very good job of uh, as an interviewer drawing out and, and letting the participants speak. And it's a very, that group is an orange to a little bit of green because you need that sensitivity to, to sympathize a little bit. And then there's a, a touch of blue. And I think part of it is that part of the reaction of men is that it's not that all the male roles are terrible and men don't wanna take any of them. Um, it's more like uh, men will still do the roles, but the respect that they were once afforded is no longer there. And that's been a, a major loss. And I think my personal feeling is that uh, uh, we do a very good job of um, inspiring women and enforcing their, reinforcing their importance that you as a young woman, uh, let's say have a responsibility and you can give back to the world and in these ways, but we are not having a dialogue with men about men that, or boys that is reinforcing for them their importance in the world. And this goes to this question of, okay, there are these subtle differences. There are some subtle differences neurologically between men and women. If you do psychometric testing, uh, there are subtle differences in the strengths of men and women across averages. Only, you can only say, uh, it's, you can only say it's average because you can, if, if I know, if I have one woman in front of me, I know nothing individually about her personality or her cognitive interests or the things that she cares about because she's an individual. Uh, if you give me a thousand women, I could probably apply a statistical model and say, based on previous research, we can do, you know, we can, we can say likely women are more interested in people. Men are somewhat more interested in things. Uh, women tend to think or use their brains more holistically, like kind of like a circle, if you can imagine between the hemispheres and men tend to use their brains more in sort of focused sort of lanes, if you like, uh, which may account for men's tendency to get obsessed with certain subject matters to the exclusion of uh, lots of other things. And this is not a judgment, it's just a tendency that you can pull out of the research. And it would be interesting to inform people about some of these differences. There's some differences in personality which show, show up across cultures. Uh, I'm afraid it's too loaded 
a subject for most people. So you have to approach it slowly. Um, in terms of meeting people where they're at and meeting men where they're at, I think it's, uh, there's something about just being, uh, you know, direct, which I think is important. Like there are these male roles, there are rewards for following through on them. However, there are also uh, deficits or problems in these roles. And we want you as men to make conscious choices about the paths you're gonna follow. Uh, and here we'll offer you the best wisdom we have from the road about what works and what doesn't. But, you know, ultimately I think the more we can inform people and guide them to an accurate view of what they're facing. So one simple one would be, you know, if you're going to go into extremely progressive integral circles, you know, uh, it's not always as lucrative as going in to work for Exxon Mobil. <laughs> uh, and, you know, some of that might be starting to change as culture changes. And I know a, a good amount of people in the integral generation who are now making actual livings, doing integral and complexity and growth, both men and women. Uh, but if I'm being totally straightforward, you're still gonna make more money if you're a hedge fund manager than that. But that kind of open allowance, which I would associate with sort of taking an integral approach is, is not where we are at this particular point. So there is this sort of tricky balance in working with men and then bringing up these problems in a way that they themselves can digest because to say something that I should have said, obviously, this is not, or I, or I said one way, but I'm gonna say another, this, this argument involves feminism, but the argument involves men and women. It's not simply women holding all these views who are then, you know, pushing them back on men. It's men who also hold a lot of these views, either out of influence educationally from feminism, or they just hold things without thinking about them. And they go about what they think they're supposed to do. And they're not thinking critically either. So we need men and women to both be thinking critically in order for this to change. And that's why you don't see the refutation aspect in, I think, your work. I think, I, you know, I'm glad to hear you're doing journalism that's informed by this. I know a few journalists who do um, and get some engagement. But that refutation would be very healthy. I would love to, you know, have that debate with someone who knows the men's issues material and then come back and say, but what about this? Because um, then we're in a then we're in a dialogue and then we're in in a creative dialogue. But I don't think. I think men's issues have to capture the attention of more people at the sort of just ground level before a response. So if I were in a feminist position of some uh, repute uh, and, and status, why am I gonna argue about something that nobody seems to really want to argue about uh, or just some random journalist. Uh, I think it's going to have to be more and more people bringing up these questions 
that will, you know, force the dialectic of progress. Uh, and that would be my, you know, if, if I uh, can make it to 20 more years to a point where some of this is just taught in school, these both sides, meaning university in particular, that would be a massive success as far as I'm concerned. Okay, bet. This has just been such an amazing presentation. I have been just completely enjoying everything. Mark, I just wanna make Thank sure you know that right up front. Okay, uh, so I brought in my husband just because, you know, <laughs> He's a man. Yeah, well, I'm very interested in this topic. Can okay, I so we're both going to have a question. I know that's not fair to everyone. So Steve is going to go first. Okay, well, I'm very interested in this because I feel in some ways on the front lines of actually in the weeds trying to make a change because I left my job as a civil engineer working 10 hour days for a, for a construction company that was just terrible, sucking my soul. And I joined BET and I became a homemaker basically. And I was scolded by my parents and told by everybody, this was a bad idea. Uh, the career is the most valuable thing. And I felt a lot of need to justify, oh, I'm gonna become a musician. I'm gonna do this, all these different kind of hobbies or, or pursuits that really my job was as a homemaker. And I've struggled a lot over the last six years of doing this with telling people what I do and trying to justify myself. And I finally, the current state I'm at is the state of the relative acceptance where I just tell people I'm a homemaker and my wife makes the money and I don't try to justify it with anything else. And I wonder if you have any advice for me in this situation, like how do I tell people what I do and not feel like I'm lowering my status or not a justified person? And before you answer, uh, I have, I'm in tech, and all my women friends are like, when's Steve gonna get a job? Don't you feel like he should be working? I mean, what is he really doing? I mean, they really, they grill me. And I'm, I've gone for like, he's making music, he's doing art, I'm supporting him to just being like, he's his own person. You know, I, I also have a hard time explaining to people that my husband is not a bum. He's, he supports me. He feeds me every meal. I, I just like sit and work and he gives me food and I, it's like very valuable. Yes. So just interesting to note, if we flipped the situation and we gave you the supportive role and you're doing all the homework and cooking and, you know, it's, it takes a lot to manage a house and uh, your husband's making the income. Maybe now people would start to say like well when is she going to get a job but more people would just be like oh okay you have a you have a a supportive like dyad there where you're each doing different roles and it works for your couplehood and great um that's lovely to hear i'm glad you're both happy and so on um uh I think the hard part, um, and this is a hard part of psychology of, of being with other people in general. When you have a belief or a life choice that conflicts with theirs, you kind of have a couple of strategies. The most simple one is you just say it and you don't communicate ambiguity you're and you're not gonna explain yourself mm -hmm. this is what i do this is what my husband does end of conversation and it's a little bit of a strategy or a tactic that says to the other person oh you accept what is going on and so therefore it must be okay and to a certain extent that will be how some of this is normalized, is as more couples make non-traditional decisions and don't apologize for them and just share them, you know, this is what I'm doing in the world with my mm -hmm. life, that will 
that will do something. It's it, it maybe in a good example is, uh, you know, let's say 30, 40 years ago, you were in, in, in an interracial relationship, which would be very uncommon. You could walk into that situation ready to defend why having an interracial relationship is not a bad thing and all of the stereotypes that people would bring to it. Or you could just be like, hi, nice to meet you. This is my husband. <laughs> hi, nice to meet you. This is my wife. Mm -hmm. The other level, and this is always a tricky one, is are there people who you can take the dialogue to a slightly more deep place, mm -hmm. you know, and be able to say to them, you know, look, in my relationship, these are the choices that we've made and it really works for us or this is our plan and, you know, not something we don't talk about or think about. So I can imagine, you know, um, for you, you might want to have that dialogue and talk about what you're doing that isn't paid work at this point or isn't um, sort of the stereotype type paid work and talk about why you made that decision because your soul was being sucked out by your civil engineering job. You with your friends might wanna, if you have a friend who you feel like is a little more hip, you might be like, you know, this is the choice we've made and it, you know, I don't see him that way. And that's not how our relationship is. and. And in a nice way, say, you're stereotyping me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and with, with, you know, pressures like, you know, like social pressures um, that people don't question. And that's always a tougher call. I always say, you know, have those dialogues with people you think you can trust that they've given you some evidence that they're open-minded and willing to listen. And you just look for opportunities to talk because that's, it's not helping you in your life to receive that criticism of your husband and, and your lifestyle um, and so forth. So if there are chances to go deeper, you take those opportunities and then you've done, from my perspective, you know, a good thing, which is you, you open up other people's minds a little bit to uh, more different ways of living a life that are legitimate. And I think if progressiveness means anything, that's what it means is that there are lots of ways to live a legitimate life and people should have the freedom to choose and to the, the extent that we can not go around judging everybody uh we shouldn't or you know we can hold our tongues about our opinions you know of other people's choices which are their choices um i i think about it that way so i would say yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a hard situation when you're clashing with your local culture in some ways, but you know if you can do a couple of small things, you're doing a lot. Um, Steve made a comment that the orange mindset, the orange beaming, doesn't really value the homemaker role in either gender, and I think that problem is compounded by. What, you know, if we think about it, it does seem hypocritical to encourage women to have the same access to the workplace and not give men the option out of the workplace if they want to. Um, you know, if, if we can choose to facilitate a household where one person works, whoever that is, who is maybe passionate about working, maybe they don't love it, but they enjoy it or there's, they benefit from it. And the other person wants to take care of the home because it is work and it does require time and why not? And I, I do, I would see that as an integral step forward to be able to have that discussion. And also for 
people in earlier stages of their relationship, younger people um, who are getting into a relationship to be able to have very open and honest discussions about what it means in the future for one person to possibly, whether, you know, we always talk about the discussion being about children. It may or may not include children, but, you know, talking about roles. I feel like nowadays the problem with, part of the problem with the V, v Green meme is that there isn't there's a lot of confusion. It's like we're exploring so many venues that we don't know what's what anymore. It's like we don't know what goes and we can't even talk about it. So being able to have those discussions about responsibility, options, and a direct way, I think would be very helpful. Yeah. So <laughs> just to say quickly, you know, uh, I I don't think that the the caretaker house sort of running and organizing role gets the respect that it deserves. It's, it's work, it's complex, uh, and it's a legitimate life choice. Where is that disrespect coming from? Is it, I don't have the answer to this question, is it partially because it's seen as a traditional role? So it's looked down upon for that reason? Is, have we so defined success as the, the what men are supposed to do that we just don't take the homemaker role as seriously? I think that's possible and that's a problem because to have one version of what it means to be a successful person, successful in quotes, I mean, even the word is leading, is not healthy for people. There should be multiple pathways in life. I do think, you know, postmodernism has got everybody's head on a swivel and there, it's very hard to, to, both hold the diversity that is the promise of postmodernism while having the clarity that actually gives people pathways. And that's, that's a, a lot of the work in psychotherapy is that process of there's all these choices, but what is what is the path that you might take? Um, and that's a self-reflective process uh, that, you know, the, the more society can facilitate it, the better off we'll be. Um, did you have a question, Bet? I did, but I noticed that we only have a few minutes left. So um, mine are all about, because I'm a career person, and I wanted to talk about that, but it's too big. And we'll talk about it in its own session sometime. So I'm done. Paul. You know, I'm going to, we only have a few minutes. So I'm going to, I think I already have an answer to my own question. Um, <laughs> uh, I, Mark could probably expand on it, but I'm going to, I'm going to lower my hand and turn back over to Bill. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mark, it was great to see you again. Mark and I go way back. Uh, I got started with the spiral, but then I heard about Integral, and then I joined the JFK Institute, and uh, Mark was my first instructor in uh, Introduction to Integral Theory. Um, I think my paper was about breast cancer. Wasn't that the one where I had an integral view of breast cancer and wound up getting it published in the Thing. But uh, anyway, um, uh, you know, Mark was a great instructor and he was very insightful and uh, very inspiring. And uh, I really like the, the thought about the sex roles being basically blue. And um, we really don't know about orange and green with regard to sex roles. Everything is just sort of open ended. Um, but I've been reading this book uh, here called The uh, tyranny of merit mm -hmm. um, and as we're all allowed to be whatever we want to be um, it becomes a responsibility then so if you're not successful it's your own damn fault 
And that's pretty hard to take. And he brings this up a lot that um, in our meritocracy, uh, everybody believes that they get their just desserts. So uh, if they make a million dollars, they deserve it. Um, if they make it into Harvard, they deserve it. Um, they don't really give credit to all the people along the way that help them. Uh, and they, they think that they've earned it. And of course, the reverse side of that, if you haven't made it, then again, it's your own damn fault. And he really thinks that Trump has tapped into this because so many people are not happy and they feel like they're stuck and they feel like um, women or minorities are sort of bypassing them. And so um, you had mentioned respect earlier about men and, and so many people aren't feeling that respect now. And Trump gives yeah. it to them. Trump, Trump is the one thing Trump does. He, he will never criticize his loyal fans. And, you know, we all know that uh, if you want to learn something, you have to be challenged and then get support. Uh, but he he doesn't challenge them at all. He just, you know, says you're you're great, even though you're racist or whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I guess my my interesting uh, or my, my question there is, you know, where um, do you think we can talk about the the masculine and the feminine in in more orange and green and maybe even yellow or are are well, the sex roles just pr pretty much blue? Well, I think you know what based on what we were talking about today, I would say I think that while blue still exists for women, uh, they've done a pretty good job of breaking through into orange, which would then be sort of, okay, you can take a couple of roles now, including the career role. Orange is not that complex, but it can offer you some more rational pathways. So home care, home taker, or caretaker is, is a pathway, career is a pathway. Green, is like an expansion of you can do all kinds of things you don't have to have children you don't have to have a partner uh you 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 know your partner can be same-sex partner green opens so much more up now with that i think it's feminism has carried over some of the problems i was mentioning so we see that some of the benefits of the higher memes, and then we see some of the problems. With men, we are more kind of at blue. Orange would be, you can take a couple of different rational pathways instead of just needing to be this sort of successful, you know, meritorious ideal. And then green would be, open it up still further. And I don't, I, I think we only see some elements of that. It's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. So if you go to like a progressive retreat, you might have the chance as a man to explore some green perspectives, but it's not necessarily gonna be about your role in society and the way that you fit in with everybody else it's going to be a little more just upper left quadrant, if you like. So I think it's it, there's this sort of complex package. And I don't, no one can fully know, I think, what an orange masculinity and a fully green one would look like. And I think those are the things we need to figure out so that we, we can then come to uh, a more integral view of gender overall, which includes not only the upper left, but the lower left, the lower right, all of Wilbur's four quadrants. Um, and that's a project for, for the times. And there's no doubt that Trump is pressing some buttons, although I would say his private behavior is that he will throw any man under the bus as quickly as it serves his needs. So while he caters 
to sort of a certain portion of men's egos if they were looking at his behavior of how he treats other men they would they would be seeing it differently he you know he famously doesn't pay people men included for their work uh and he will he will stab anybody in the back man woman <laughs> so he he's not a I think some people in the men's issues movement, men's rights movement have been fooled by Trump because he does stroke people's egos in that way, but they're not looking at his incredible contradictions and you know his tendency to to be totally disloyal once it serves his purposes with other men and I would say that's a, a breaking of, of an interesting type of male social code. Like what you don't do is you don't cross your teammates, you know? Uh, that, and I think that's a, that's a nice part of masculinity in a lot of cases is you, you know, you work as a team and you support people who have been supportive to you uh, and I don't see that in Trump, which is why I think Trump is essentially red and not even amber. Uh, but that might be part of his appeal, unfortunately. If we were to get this sorted out more as a society, I think Trump would be less attractive to a lot of people, uh, would, is my speculation. Uh, but let's, let's well hope. said thank you very much good let's to see you again hope. yeah good to see you and <laughs> let's hope we don't have to go down that road again in 2024 uh it's a, we've had enough so, um, mark do you need to get going or do we have time for paul's comment we maybe do just one more okay and i, I should i stop the recording now i mean we're we're at the top of the hour it's up to you, Paul. You're the last person. Okay, well, I'll stop it right after. Um, I'm, I'm going to key off, I'm going to kind of go back to my original, what, what I originally crafted my question to be and key off with something that Bill said. I guess I would argue that um, any discussion about balancing, you know, male roles, female roles, it, it, there's no, there is no orange, um, worldview to discuss this. I mean, the whole orange worldview is about um, pursuing and increasing your own material well-being. And the reality is in our world, that's, that is facilitated through orange institutions, you know, thousands and thousands of them. And as we discussed over and over in this, in this last two hours, um, in order for those institutions to thrive and survive, they need everybody, everybody to sacrifice their families, their relationships, and give it over to the corporation. I remember many years ago, I read the book, The Corporate Unit, and I can't remember who the author was, but but it it was kind of satirical to me. But, but the truth is, in order for a true orange-centric world to survive, Everybody has got to sacrifice their relationships and their family and that in order to be successful in that. And so for that reason, I don't think a, a true solution is going to come out of. Yes, there will be rationality in, injected into it, but it's not going to come out of that worldview. Can you just briefly comment on that? Yes. So I would say, first of all, I appreciate the point very much. Uh, I wouldn't say that I expect Orange to provide the sort of end state solution. In other words, I do think we will need to get to an integral yellow teal space before we're going to see something like uh, more real freedom. And we are struggling with 
uh, the massive shadow of orange materialism, as you're pointing out, um, as as a person who is uh, not well read on the many complexities of economies and production and all that whole world space, um, I tend to feel a little uh, out of my depth when it gets to these questions of, okay, here is the nature of capitalism and what would we do next that would preserve whatever the benefits are and negate its downsides. I always, I listen, but I feel a little lost, but there's absolutely uh, no disputing that orange can suck the life out of just about everybody uh, in pursuit of uh, productivity. And that that is one of its major downsides. And that's why it's not sufficient or part of why it's not sufficient uh, to be the sort of dominant worldview and that we need uh, particularly an integral worldview. Um, how that happens exactly, I don't know and want to be candid about that. But I feel that that's a very lively space, particularly I'll say in the integral world. And it has been for about the last 10 years or so that the conversation has shifted um, further away from personal growth uh, and more towards social systems questions. Uh, and, and how to order the good society integrals become very political. And we used to be criticized for, for being apolitical. And now, now, I, now I, I think we've swung too far the other way. Uh, we could use a little extra space to, to also <laughs> do the personal growth thing still, but uh, yeah, you're point you're pointing out one of the the massive questions that we have to tackle as a society, uh, which is how do you move past the the massive shadow of orange or the mean orange meme, as uh, I've heard it, heard it uh, also said. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for your question. <laughs>